Candace hardly needs an introduction. She's well known in our community. And I have to tell you, the first time I went out to learn how to harvest seeds over some plants that were growing in a ditch along a road, she taught me how to do that. And it was just a wonderful experience. And I never forget her taking this neophyte and getting me all trained up. As I said, she's well known and she is very much involved in master naturalist and master gardener. And she speaks all over our region, mainly, of course, now about monarchs, but she is really a community access. I mean, we just love her. And she has done a lot to inspire us to do more with the monarch, as well as get us educated so we do the right things for the monarch. Welcome, Chris. Thank you so much for that, Helen. Thank you all for having me back. I did a talk, I think, in 2019 in person to a group of people. So welcome back, all you monarch experts and all you monarch newbies. And it's wonderful to see people from so many places here. I'm just so, so, so very excited to be presenting this to you tonight. So I hope there's something new for even you experts out there. All right, we're going to cover tonight basic facts, monarch life cycle, migration, a couple of new studies that are really interesting with Gulf Coast concerns, talk a little bit about native milkweed, and we're going to take a quick trip to Mexico to the overwintering sites. So what are we talking about tonight? Monarch butterfly, Dennis plexippus, Latin name. They are the world's most iconic butterfly. They migrate up to 3,000 miles as far as the northern range of milkweed in Canada to the overwintering sites in Mexico. And yes, there are monarchs throughout the world, and they all own their DNA to our monarchs. We have the original monarchs, so their DNA all came from ours, but none of them do this great migration that our monarchs do. Ours can also fly with a little help from a tailwind, 250 miles a day, and glider pilots have seen them whizzing alongside them at over 10,000 feet in altitude. In 2014, U.S. Fish and Wildlife was petitioned to protect our North American migrating monarch underneath the Endangered Species Act. It took a number of years for them to come to decision. Finally, 2020, December, they decided that indeed that listing was warranted, but it was precluded by higher priority listing actions. And that means there's other species in line ahead of the monarch butterfly, and they will review this status annually. And of course, I know you've heard there's an international organization that has put the monarch butterfly already on the red endangered species list. And we will see if this has any impact on our listing with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife. So that remains to be seen. We'll see what happens this year. We can't talk about monarchs without talking about the milkweed, the Sclepius genus, the genus of obligate toxic host plants for the monarch caterpillar. So mom and dad monarch can nectar on any number of flowering plants, but when it comes time for mom to lay her eggs, she needs to find the milkweed. It's the only plant that has the nutrients that will get her little larva through all of its five stages. We know that milkweeds contain a lot of toxins. They're called cardinalides. They're toxic steroids. And some milkweeds can contain up to 10 different of these toxic steroids. And these are similar to digitalis and foxglove. So what the little monarch caterpillar does is they ingest these toxins and rather than just passing them through and neutralizing them, they sequester them within their own tissues. So they become toxic as well. And they pass that along to the rest of the life cycle so that the chrysalis is, remains toxic and the adult butterfly retains that toxicity. And this makes them unpalatable to most of their predators. We're going to look at the monarch life cycle kind of quickly next, the egg three to five days before it hatches, the larval stage, or also called their caterpillar stage, 10 to 14 days. And during this time, it goes through five different end stars or stages. The pupa or the chrysalis stage, another 10 to 14 days. So total elapsed time from the egg being laid to our adult butterfly eclosing or coming out of that chrysalis is about a month. But the adult butterfly lives an average of either one month or nine months. And that is because the monarch butterfly that migrates to Mexico does live for nine months. And we will talk about that when we go over migration. The monarch egg, very, very tiny, and mom usually lays it on the underside of the leaf. This is a photo of one on the top side, very small. She can lay between three and 400 over a two and five week period of time. And only about one out of a hundred make it to become an adult butterfly. This little egg casing is clear. 
And so you're usually a day before the monarch caterpillar comes out, you'll see that it turned dark at the top and that's the head of this little caterpillar. And he doesn't kick or chew his way out. He's got to eat a hole and then he turns around and he addresses that egg and he eats the entire egg as his first meal. And note that this does not look like our regular monarch caterpillar has no coloration. It's colorless and with this little dark shiny head. And this is our first end star that does not begin getting any coloration till it starts eating the milkweed leaf. So we have five different end stars and the scientists have a very good way and an easy way for us to tell the, the different end stars of the caterpillars. So this caterpillar here and this one here are all our first end stars and they're very easy to tell because we usually tell by tentacle length and this first end star absolutely has no tentacle length and they're either the white color or they have just this clear look and no visible tentacles. So this is our little first end star. Second end star, we're now opaque, and you can definitely see the little tentacles. Even the back ones are tiny little bumps. Third end star, I think this is when this looks like a monarch caterpillar to me. Quite a bit plumper, and if the tentacles were stretched forward, they would reach the end of the head. They molt in between each of these end stars. There, These caterpillars are growing so very, very quickly that their skin can't keep up. So they're always growing another one underneath. So in between each end star, they molt. They will literally walk out of their skin and they will usually turn around and consume it. And you can see on this one, I actually took early this year, you can see even his little feet inside and, and how small this that he just walked out of. So I, I think this to me, this is like the original Spanx. Fourth end star, if the tentacles were pressed forward, they would reach the end of the head, past the end of the head. Third is end of the head. Fourth is past the end, end of the head. And then we have our fifth end star, our big, big guy. It's in this end star, the longest. This end star is eating voraciously uh, for three to five days. And its tentacles are so long, it will drag on the ground or they hold it up almost like a like a longhorn just huge much much almost double the size i think it's double the size of the fourth end star so after the fifth end star well first we're going to look at the the size comparison we've got in the front our first end star and now our fifth end star less than two weeks 10 to 14 days two thousand percent growth pretty pretty amazing feet then we go uh, form our J. So we, the monarch will move usually quite a ways uh, away from the milkweed and it will find a place that's kind of semi-sheltered and lay down this kind of silky pad, very, very strong, hang upside down from it in this J and stay in it for about 24 hours. At that time, he's ready to pupate. So it goes through one more last molt, usually straightens out of this J and then you'll see this lateral line forming along the side of the caterpillar. And it begins contracting and compacting. And so you can see that we're losing the skin one last time. And of course, this molt is one that will not be able to eat because it will, it's going into the chrysalis stage. And as it's compacting and contracting, this uh, chrysalis will start to move violently about this really, this is a time lapse, but it really is very quick. I'd say this is usually over in 10 or 12 minutes or so, very, very quickly. And yes, it gyrates just like this in real time and usually throws off and it will throw off this molt. But I have yet to see, that's how strong this silken thread and this pad that they lay down. I have yet to see a chrysalis fly off during these gyrations. So the chrysalis stage lasts about 10 to 14 days and it's clear just like the eggshell was. So you can watch the wings forming over the 10 to 14 day period of time. When the monarch is ready to eclose, a little hatch will open up in the side. And this happens so quickly once that little hatch begins to open, the monarch literally just drops out in like less than a second. And you just think it's gonna fly and, and get smushed on the ground, but they will cling. It's amazing how well they can cling to the bottom of this chrysalis. Their abdomen is gigantic when they come out of the chrysalis and the wings are small. You would think there's no way this, this will ever, ever fly but the abdomen is full of fluid that gets pumped into these wings. So the monarch will hold onto the bottom of this chrysalis and will be twisting back and forth and back and forth and pumping that fluid into those wings. And this doesn't take too, too long of a time. And sometimes I have seen a monarch 
fall from the chrysalis and they will always try to climb up and hang straight down because they have to hang straight for these wings to fill out straight and then they've got to dry. So they're in a very, this is a very critical period for them because obviously there's no defenses. They cannot fly. There's nothing they can do. So it's best if we ever come across these to definitely leave them alone and let them get their, fill their wings out. This is a, a good photo to see how big the abdomen looks when the, it first comes out of the chrysalis. The first time I saw this, I thought there's not any way this thing will ever fly. And the wings look so tiny, but yes, they do. It's just, it's really, really amazing. And sometimes it takes hours and even often they don't leave to the next day. I've seen a monarch eclose and it was a rainy day. So they're not going to, they don't want to fly during that time. And they will wait to the next day. The sun comes out and they warm up and then they will fly off. So uh, they take off when they are ready. Female ovipositing. So this is a female monarch laying an egg. And as I said, they usually lay on the underside of the leaf. So what she does is she curls her abdomen and places that egg on the other side of the leaf. And of course, the egg is very, very sticky or it would not adhere to the underside of the, the leaf. And this is what it looks like when she's ovipositing. The difference between male and female, really, really easy to tell. There's a couple ways to tell. The female tends to have heavier, thicker black veining and the male thinner. And the male has claspers on the end of the abdomen, hard to see without a hand lens or being very close. But the, the telltale sign are these little black sacs that actually are no longer used by the monarch, but they still have them on either side of the male's abdomen. It's always in the same place. And you often can see this sac through the wing when the wing is closed. And so now we're going to be talking about the mystery of migration. Now, this is my favorite thing to talk about because this is what got me interested in the monarchs uh, years and years and years ago when I first understood the generations and the migration. So scientists know it goes back at least a million years. Some scientists think as much as two million years. And it become much more extensive in the last 20,000. And that was after the last ice age, a lot of new land was opened up after the ice sheets retreated. The milkweed was able to expand their territory and where the milkweed went, the monarchs followed after them. So that's how the monarchs got all the way up now into Northern Canada. So the milkweed probably quadrupled what they used to be. And as the milkweed became greater in its distribution, so did the monarch. So the monarch population bloomed with all this new milkweed. Scientists love studying navigation. There are literally hundreds of studies on this, and there's not a lot of consensus about it, but there are a couple of things. And one thing is there's a consensus. They use a time-compensated sun compass that helps direct flight. Information from the monarch's eyes and antenna processed through their little brain to tell them kind of which direction and which time to leave. They also know there's a magnetic compass part of this migration, or, or navigation, but they're not yet decided on how this comes about. So there's a lot more tests and studies to be done. But suffice to say, this little guy's got a lot going on for something that weighs about as much as a small paperclip. We're going to talk a lot about the migration right now in the different generations. But first, we're going to talk about what we're not going to talk about, and that is there is a small population in California. It's, I think it was down 99% in the last few years and made a small comeback last year. We'll see what happens this year. There's been a lot of work put into it and a lot done by our Xerxes Society that I'm using their migration map. They've done a lot of work there in California, but they generally overwinter on the coast and move a little bit inland and come back to the coast for the winter. They don't often any of the monarchs end up in our North American monarch migration. So we're not talking about California today. Then we're not also talking about this. There's a population in the lower part of Florida that is now no longer part of the migration. There's an awful lot of OE disease. There's an awful lot of tropical milkweed there. So there's milkweed available all year round for the, the diseased monarchs. So they no longer migrate at all. So we're not talking about them. We are talking about east of the Rockies to the east coast, up to the northern range of milkweed. And up here in the northwest, there's no milkweed right now. So they're not there. So the northern range of milkweed, and then all the way down to Mexico, the overwintering sites. So we have to start our migration someplace. So we're going to start from Mexico in the winter. They come through us, and this is our goal for, you know, for, for those of us on the Gulf Coast, this is our migration route for our monarchs. They come through us generally around mid-October to mid-November, but I've seen them as late coming through in large numbers as late as Thanksgiving week. 
they start arriving from all over the United States to Mexico, generally around November 1st. They don't all stream in at the same time. They come over November and even some arrive in December, but they start usually uh, November the 1st. So the thing to know about these migrating monarchs that are coming all over and headed to Mexico, there's two things and it has to do with resources. The first thing is they have this very long journey. When a monarch starts breeding, it uses up all the resources and their life cycle goes down to the one month. So these monarchs that are migrating to Mexico go into reproductive diapause. They are not breeding on the journey. They are not breeding in Mexico the whole winter long. The second thing is they're where they go in Mexico are high in the mountains. It's quite, quite cold. There are hardly any nectar plants there and not near enough for the millions upon millions of monarchs that spend the winter there the whole winter. So they have to arrive not with only the resources to make such a long journey for wherever they're coming from, but enough resources for them to last all winter long until they start leaving March 1st. So that's pretty amazing. They will go get a drink of water, but that's it. They kind of go in a semi-hibernative state, hanging up in the trees, no food. So we're November the 1st, monarchs are starting arriving. <clears throat> They're here in Mexico, November, December, January, and February. Come March 1st, and they don't know how this quite happens, but the monarchs know it's our Mexican vacation is over. It's time for us to begin leaving. So they start streaming out of Mexico starting around March the 1st. Not all at the same time, just like they didn't come in all the same time, but they begin leaving. And their first stop, they come to see us in Texas. We are so very, very lucky. So they come usually, they start arriving. I've seen them as early as like March the 8th, honestly, uh, monarch laying eggs in a, a prairie on March the 8th. But they're generally mid-March to mid-April coming through. When they come, what do they need? They are desperate, desperate for nectar. They haven't eaten all winter long. When they're leaving Mexico, also, they get the impulse or the, as far as going north, also that it's time to start mating. So the first thing they need, of course, is nectar so they can build up the resources so they can lay eggs. So what's happening in Texas and in March and in April, all of our winter wildflowers are blooming. They're coming up plenty of nectar for those monarchs. Same thing, our native milkweed is just coming up fresh and very, very tender for them to lay their eggs on so their little caterpillars get off to a good start. So the timing is absolutely perfect. So these migrating monarchs come here to mate, lay their eggs and die. Very few of them go any further than Texas for this migrating monarch that has lived for nine months. So generation number one is born in our area as well. They do something completely different their senses tell them we begin mating immediately because we are just going to live for one month. Our goal in life is to mate, nectar, and head further north. So they head further north, kind of into this darker green, orange area. Lay their eggs and die. Generation number two is born. Do the same thing as their parents. They're only going to live one a month. They go even further north, and they're filling out this entire range of uh, milkweed. And as they're traveling, the milkweed is coming up and the and their wildflowers are are blooming. So they are following the fresh native milkweed as it's coming up and the wildflowers are there as they are blooming. So they're building up this population and this third generation uh, by this time is late summer and there's a lot more monarchs because they have multiplied during these three generations. Generation number four is born early fall. August or so, some even, maybe even in September. And what does generation number four do? They're already at the northern range of milkweed. What is happening up north this time of year? The trees are starting to turn color, lose their leaves maybe. The native milkweed is starting to die back. So is the native wildflowers. They can't go any further north. They don't want to lay their eggs on dying milkweed. They know that they are the generation that is going to live for nine months and their goal in life Reproductive diapause, we are not going to make, we're saving all our resources because we have a long journey to make all the way to Mexico. We've got a nectar, 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 make that long journey and save up resources too so we can last all winter long and come back in Texas in the spring at the end of our nine months. So generation one, two, and three live an average of one month. That fourth generation that travels to Mexico every year. So we've got three months and nine months. That's our 12 months. And that is the monarch, how special it is. No other butterfly has this magnificent 
three generations that live an average of a month and this nine month generation. So this is what makes our monarch butterfly, North American migrating monarch butterfly so very, very special and why we are so important. So we are the first stop uh, when they're starving from uh, Mexico. We need our native milkweed, we need our flowers. And in the fall, we're the last step for fast food before they hit Mexico. We could not be more important in Texas, all of Texas. So where do they go in Mexico? They're not just flying right across the border. They've got a long journey to go once they even cross the border here. This is Mexico City, and this is the transvolcanic belt, and they are high in these mountains. They're looking for this tree. It's called an OML fir tree. And this is where they like to roost. And this tree doesn't generally start growing till about 10,000 feet in altitude. If you look, this is the key for the OML forest. And look at these tiny little places where it finds its habitat. So very small areas that these monarchs have to find. Pretty incredible that they make their way there. And I show every presentation, I have to show this photo. I'm sorry, you may have seen it again, but this is an obvious migrating monarch, a male. You can see his little spot through his wing because his wing is almost transparent. I took this in March a couple of years ago at the Texas City Prairie Preserve. He landed not so far from me, so I got his photo. He is nectaring on one of our native milkweeds. We'll be talking about Asclepius linera slim milkweed. But this is the beautiful sight to see that we can see these migrating monarchs in the spring. And when you think about it, Nobody else gets to see these migrating monarchs except for us here in Texas. So really, really super, super special. All right, we're going to talk about a couple scientific studies. And I have a one of my little hobbies. I like to read every single scientific study out on monarchs. So we're going to go through two briefly that came out this year that I thought were really, really interesting. This one just came out in February of 2022. Parasite dynamics, these have some titles and we'll go through it though. Parasite dynamics, North American monarchs predicted by host density and seasonal migratory culling. So look down at number two, kind of tells about what they were after here. Monarch butterflies are commonly infected with the protozoan OE and we are gonna ta be talking about OE. Because this parasite lowers monarch survival and flight performance and because migratory monarchs have experienced declines in recent decades, it is important to understand the patterns and drivers of infection. So what they did, they went back and found samples that were scientifically preserved over the years as far back as they could of monarch butterflies and wanted to test them to see if which ones were highly infected with OE. And there were many years that they did not have enough good samples to collect data from. But they got some as far back as 1968, and this study went through 2020. The historical average of the heavily infected all the way up to 2001 came out to half of a percent. I think it's probably even lower than they had expected of this. However, from 2006 to 2020, there was a four-year gap in data here. There were some other gaps as well, but for some reason, it jumped from half of a percent to 11%, which really is a huge, huge, huge jump in a very short period of time. Their first thought was that it had something to do with climate change, uh, storms, fires, all kinds of things that they overlaid all the things they could possibly think of environmental things on top of this to see what would correlate with this jump here. And nothing clicked, nothing looked right that fit in. So what they did next was do a timeline of historical events relevant to monarchs in North America. So they started with, uh, they put in here 1975 when the Mexico, the colonies were discovered. So 1975 is where they discovered where the monarchs we're finally overwintering. Do you know we put a man on the moon way before this? So there's a whole lot of monarch science yet to be known because we're kind of a little late on this. But yes, 1975, there was a lot of interest in monarchs in the 1990s. Monarch Watch was founded, uh, Journey North, one of the citizen science, this is the first citizen science project and one I still do, Monarch Larval Monitoring Project, late 90s. International Butterfly Breeders Association, and not just particularly this association, but there's other associations and businesses now. It used to be they sold monarch caterpillars and butterflies for educational purposes, for schools, for children to learn the life cycle and that. But now we are have many businesses now that are selling these monarchs by the many hundreds for people to release at funerals, weddings, and other events. 
I won't say anything more about that. Then tropical milkweed becomes popular in the home gardens during this period of time, begin of, of home rearing fad. And lo and behold, in the middle of it all, Facebook is launched. And I won't say anything about all this either. And then Monarch Watch Away Station was in 2005. So this is from their abstract. They were not specifically pointing fingers, but here's what they said. We estimate that tens of thousands of fear monarchs reach over wintering sites in Mexico as a result of OE, highlighting the need to consider the parasite as a potential threat to the monarch population. Increases in infection among eastern northern migrating monarchs, that's ours, post-2002, suggests that changes to the host ecology or environment have intensified parasite transmission. Further work is needed to examine the degree to which human practices such as mass caterpillar rearing and the widespread planting of exotic milkweed have contributed to this trend. So a lot more study needs to be done, but they've done some groundwork and it was a very interesting study. I can send you a link. This one is even newer. This came out May 16 of this year. I read this in the Chicago airport as it came out. This is interesting too. Impacts of larval host plant species on dispersal traits and free flight energetics of adult butterflies. It sounds kind of complicated, but it's really not. It's really interesting what they did here. So a number of years ago, and I know y'all know about this, we had a push. We need more milkweeds in the ground. We just got to grow more milkweed, more milkweed. We can't grow enough. We can't put out enough milkweed. And so this is from their abstract as well. Population declines initiated international conservation efforts involving the replanting of a variety of milkweed species. We didn't care what it was. We were just planting more milkweed. However, this practice was implemented with little regard for how diverse defensive chemistry of milkweeds, how the cardinalides and the nutrients in the milkweeds were experienced by the monarch larva, the caterpillars, then that may affect adult fitness traits, the monarch butterfly. Our findings indicate Host plant species can impact monarchs by affecting fuel requirements for flight. So what they did was I thought was just really interesting. So they took eight different milkweeds and widely dispersed milkweeds. Tuberosa and verticulata were two of them. And these, these are two that actually we're going to have in our plant cell and two that we're going to cover here in a little bit, but also common milkweed and others that are common throughout the United States. And also they did tropical milkweed, the Cursaveca. What they did was they raised a number of caterpillars on individual species of milkweed. So, you know, like a hundred raised on world, a hundred on tuberosa. And they wanted to see the monarch butterflies that came from these different species of milkweed, if there was any differences in the monarch butterflies, because some of these, as we talked about, some of these milkweeds have 10 different cardinalides. So the chemical compounds and the nutrients of each of these species can be very different. One of the things they did when they were dissecting and looking at the butterflies is they noticed that the butterflies raised on the, the tropical milkweed had one of their flight muscles in their wing was larger than the other species of um, milkweed. And so that was interesting. So they went on and did all other kinds of tests. When it came down to do metabolic rates, the monarchs that were reared on the tropical milkweed had a higher metabolic rate than any, and quite a bit higher than any of the other milkweeds. So the scientists were thinking, okay, so these monarchs need to nectar much, much more often. They're burning off their calories much, much quicker because they have this high metabolic rate and maybe possibly, I don't know, because of, the, because of that larger muscle. So they won't be able to travel as far and as fast as the other monarch butterflies raised on other milkweeds. And is it possible that maybe then even these butterflies would not be able to make that very long journey to Mexico because they, they have to leave at a certain time and they've got to arrive at a certain time before the freeze is in the fall and before there's no nectar plants to even nectar on along the ways. And taking that even further, some were talking about if they even made it to Mexico, how would they ever have enough reserves for them to last the whole winter because they are already using their metabolic rate is much higher. So I thought this, there's going to be a lot, I'm sure from this, this just came out in May. So I'm sure there'll be other studies done, but I thought this was just really fascinating. We're going to talk about OE in a second, but we're going to talk about the other bad guys in our monarch world. And so these are our most common predators here along the Gulf Coast. 
anoles, every color of anole, the brown anoles, the invasive anoles, or green anoles here, they all can prey on manor caterpillars and occasionally even on an adult butterfly. Paper wasps as well, but they mostly specialize in our caterpillar. And then we have a number of predatory stink bugs. This one I've seen a number of time and it was a very unusual insect. I took photos of it and I had ID it on INET. It came back an anchor stink bug. And about the, this time I took this photo, I was finding information on, yes, indeed, this stink bug will attack and kill monarch caterpillars and other predatory stink bugs. So all of these have evolved to be able to stand the toxins that these little caterpillars have. The good thing about the, or if there's a good thing about these predators, if these are not usually very, very active until the summertime. I'm saying May, maybe even mid to late May. And our butterflies are coming through in March and early April. So our caterpillars are done by the end of April and our butterfly should be out of here even some time in May. So caterpillars should not be around that much when these are at their most active. Now we get to talk about our dreaded OE. And I use this chart and it's an old chart from Project Monarch Health but the newer ones don't work with a PowerPoint so well, and they're much more confusing to look at. The numbers are similar, but this just kind of gives you an idea. So this is the percentage, the rate of infection in different parts of the country. So I told you there, there's been a problem on the California coast that California population, 67% infected. The Florida area, also 67%. They have a huge problem. There's some areas in Florida where 100% test positive for OE. And there's an awful lot of tropical milkweed there too. Then us in Eastern Texas and, and those of y'all that are towards the hill country and Austin are starting to experience more of this. I think as our climate warms, it's not killing off, I don't think the tropical milkweed like it used to. So ours was 56% at this time. The good news, of course, is, or one of the good news is that the northern part of the areas where a lot of our fourth generation that are flying to Mexico only experience at 5% and the overwintering only 2%. So it's long been known that these monarchs that have OE disease cannot migrate, cannot travel very far. So what is this? This is Ophrocystis electroscara, and that's why we call it OE. It's an obligate parasite, one that needs a host to live and reproduce, and that would be the monarch or the queen butterfly, both that use milkweed as a host plant. And it's a protozoan, so rather than spend an hour in this, I'll explain it kind of as, as simply uh, to understand. So this is a protozoan. And it has kind of two different stages, uh, phases in its life cycle. It has one that's this active, growing, multiplying protozoa. And it has another stage that the scientists call a spore. I think of it almost like a seed. It's got a coat. It's inactive, but very, very viable and can stay viable really for up to a year, studies have shown. The vector of transmission of disease is usually, unfortunately, mama butterfly. Adult monarch butterflies have a concentration of the spores on their abdomen and some on their wings. They have no of the active protozoa inside them at the time of the adult monarch butterfly, but they do have the concentration of spores on their body. So when mom goes to lay that egg underneath a, a leaf, she uses that abdomen to place that egg. That egg is sticky, but so are these spores. They can stay on a leaf, as I said, for a year. She lays the egg because she has the spores on her abdomen. She's laying spores on the egg and around the egg on that milkweed. So what do we know? The first thing that little caterpillar does is he eats that eggshell consuming spores and then starts to eat the milkweed around that. And so he he's consuming those spores. The second they get in his digestive tract, that little outside coating of those spores is broken open and we have replicating the active protozoa alive and going and reproducing inside of that little caterpillar. And it does it through the entire five N stars and into the pupa stage. And that's even when the greatest damage is done. And sometimes we don't even get a monarch butterfly. It's so very, very damaged. The, the protozoa has taken so much of the monarch resources for every bite, you know, that little caterpillar takes probably half of it is going to these protozoa. But it's not in the interest of this parasite to kill the host at this point because it would have no way of its own life cycle continuing. So usually we do get a monarch butterfly from this. 
about three days before it's to eclose or come out of the chrysalis, those active protozoa shut down and produce all these spores. So there's no more active protozoa, but all the spores move to the abdomen and again to the wing. So the monarch butterfly comes out, sometimes very, very disfigured, will have deformed wings, other kinds of deformations, tacky looking abdomens that look diseased. It will absolutely look diseased or deformed, all different types of ways. Sometimes they're much, much smaller. And then sometimes they look kind of like this, looks like a pretty healthy monarch butterfly until you test it. So what we do with Project Monarch Health is they send us little stickers that are kind of like tape, lightly touch the abdomen of the monarch butterfly. So they have scales, kind of like our skin cells that fluff off. And when you touch the abdomen and look underneath the slide, you will see these scale. These are the scales of the monarch's abdomen. And then these little football shaped things are the spores of the OE. And when we send them off to Project Monarch Health, they will actually count within like, a, I think a square centimeter, how many spores to note the amount of the infection of OE. The thing about these butterflies, even though they look very bad, often they can live for, they usually do not live for an entire month, but they often live days, if not weeks, enough time to reproduce and produce more diseased eggs because this a diseased mom cannot help but lay an egg that's covered in these spores. So how the monarch butterfly usually gets rid of this disease, I mean, there's no cure for this to get rid of this protozoa. So what usually happens is we saw migratory culling. They cannot fly far with this disease. So very few of these diseased monarchs make it through the cycle all the way up to up north uh, in the summertime. And conversely, they definitely cannot make it to Mexico. And then the other way that we get rid of disease is that all of our native milkweed dies back in the winter. The leaves fall to the ground and the spores are broken down in the soil by the microorganisms. Those spores need to be eaten by a little caterpillar and, and that's the end of that. When our milkweed comes up in the spring, they're tender, there's no OE spores left. When we have a milkweed plant that is not from our area, it's from a tropical area where there's no winter, there's no freezes, there's nothing like that. And this plant is designed to live for 12 months and, and never have any kind of a senescence or a dormant period of time. It can house infected butterflies that fail to migrate. And so they can use this host plant and continue all winter long, even if they only live a couple of weeks, they can lay eggs and produce more and more and more infected butterflies. And this is what has happened in Florida. And because we are so popular on the migratory route, we cannot afford to go there. We need to have clean milkweed for our monarch butterflies. So what do we need? We're native plant people. We need native milkweed. So I'm going to talk about our most common ones here on the Gulf Coast. And these are found in other areas as well. So this is our most common milkweed on our area, Gulf Coast, Asclepias veritas, green milkweed, has sprawling growth. It's great. The monarchs love it. Takes full sun to parcels, just like most of our, our milkweeds here. They can take a lot of rain and they can take it dry too. The thing about them is you, we rarely see this in the nursery trade because very, very poor germination without this cold stratification. But this one is a little bit of a difficult one to grow on your own, but it can be done. And I can email you about how to do cold and moist stratification. It's also called green antelope horns, and this is what the pods look like. This is uh, the flower again. This is where it's native to in Texas. And there, if you're from the hill country, you have a version that's very similar to this. It's just called antelope horns. It's Asclepius esperula. And there's usually in the Western part of the state. And there's some overlapping counties that have both veritas and Asperula. Our second one is a great, great milkweed. This is our second most common milkweed next to the veritas. This is Asclepius linearis, slim milkweed, and you can tell how it gets its name. Very, very skinny little leaves, and please note that they are opposite. See, two leaves this way, two leaves going this way. They're opposite leaves. And I'm often asked, well, the, the leaves are just so skinny, there's hardly anything for those big monarch caterpillars to eat. But uh, I grew these from seed. This is one plant. It puts up many, 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 many stems. And that monarch caterpillar will eat this plant, believe me, uh, stem and all, and, and it will come back from the roots. So this actually, if you can look at all this biomass here, that's quite a lot of milkweed for these uh, monarch butterflies. Same thing as the other full to partial sun. 
the average drainage. This is what it looks like out in the wild. This is near the Texas City Prairie Preserve. These are in flower and most of our milkweed that have the white flowers, the blooms are the buds are often pink and, and lin linaris is like that. And another special thing about this milkweed is this is a Texas endemic. This is not found any place else on the planet. It's just found in Texas and only a very, very few counties, as you can see, but is absolutely found in our area. And I think this here is an anomaly. World milkweed, I'm showing this one next because this one is often confused with our Linares. It looks a lot the same, has the white flowers and has the very slim leaves. The difference, well, there's two big differences in one. Look at the distribution map for this. It's found all over the United States. It's one of the most common milkweeds. So the leaves, as the name says, are world. So they are around the stem, kind of like a bottle brush type effect. So it's different from the Linares that had just the opposites. It needs cold stratification as well, has the same requirements of the previous two milkweed. It's a good plant. This one is different from the previous plants, but this one for us, especially along the Ghost Coast in these counties here, this is a superstar. There's not even a close second here. This is a Sclepius Prentice, aquatic milkweed. It's also called Shore milkweed. Don't let the name scare you. It does not have to grow in water or really, really wet soil. It can just grow in moist soil. It does not need any cold stratification. It easily reseeds itself. All kinds of pollinators love the flowers and it does not have to be in full sun. It grows great in our gardens. It can take quite a bit of shade. I just love, love, love this plant. It's the only milkweed that does not have the white fluff on the seed. So the method of seed transmission is a little bit different. It's got big, wide seeds that can act like little kites and blow away without the fluff, or they act like little boats. So when we have a hard rain, which occasionally we have here on the Gulf Coast, they can float to other locations nearby. And again, they do have these pink buds. Perfect, perfect plant for us. And I've sent some to some people in Austin that are trying to get growers to grow some more native milkweed. So hopefully it works out for them there as well in Austin. I think it should. It's a great plant. Zizotes milkweed is a common name. It is found in our area. It's found in other areas of Texas. It's not super common here. The seeds that I collected to grow these plants I found on Galveston Island. I love the flower. It's very popular. The monarchs love it. I know Douglas King seed does sell Zizotes seeds. The thing that's different about this one, this likes a lot of sun too. This one would do best in sandy soil like they do have on Galveston and other places in West Texas and Central Texas, or very, very good drainage. So I have this growing. I've been very successful with this, but I grow it in very large pots or I grow it in a raised bed, but it's a great plant. Tuberosa butterfly milkweed. So this one, look at the distribution map on this. I think this is the winner. This is the most common milkweed in the entire country. It's a lovely, beautiful plant. These orange flowers pop very popular with many, many different pollinators. It is for us our lowest in cardinalides of all the other milkweed. And, and if you break off a leaf, it, the milky latex will not come out. So it's low. The butterflies still lay eggs on it. My tuberosa is always eaten up every year. It's not so common here on the Gulf Coast. And where I have seen this native naturally growing in our area is usually on a slope. So mine are all, and I have been most successful growing mine in a raised bed. So I don't think it needs a sandy soil like the Zizotes. And the Zizotes doesn't need sandy soil, just very good drainage. But this one, as long as you have good drainage, I think you'll deal well with tuberosa. You can readily buy seeds online does need cold stratification, but make sure because it has such a wide distribution, you're not buying seeds from um, Minnesota because those plants will probably not do it well here in, in Texas. So try to seed source as local to possible as you can to home. I need to have this comparison chart because this is our tropical milkweed that we're trying to get away from. And I cannot tell you the names that I've seen nurseries list this as it's usually not even listed as tropical milkweed anymore. It's to hide that it is tropical milkweed. It's called blood flower. I've seen called silk and something. It's often called butterfly weed. It's often called tuberosa. And it's usually this bicolor, this red and yellow, or there's a yellow version. 
to tell it from our lovely tuberosa, which is generally all orange, or there is now, unfortunately, a yellow variety to confuse the issue. Our butterfly weed, our tuberosa, has these little hairs all along the stem that the tropical milkweed does not have. And it does have no milky latex. The tropical does and all the other milkweed does. And at, at this point, I'd just like to mention that as far as the milky latex, we would have to consume quite a bit of it to get sick, but it does not take much to get on your hands if you touch your eye to get a chemical burn. So please be careful if you get milky latex on your skin. So these two milkweeds did not do anything wrong. They're just pretty scarce in our area, but I wanted to show them. Asclepius hertella, tall green milkweed. These are the leaves. The leaves are very, very slim. They almost look like blades of grass. They're much longer than the Linares leaves and the leaves of the verticulata. And then also our Asclepius vertiflora is not so common here. It is found here, green comet milkweed, really, really a neat and unusual plant. And at this time, I'd also like to mention, if you find native milkweeds out in the prairie or elsewhere, don't ever, ever, ever remove them. They never transfer uh, well. The best thing to do if you want to go back and collect seeds, ask permission, and then go get some seeds and try to grow them yourself. Almost at the end of the presentation now, I've got to mention pollinator plants. I know Greg is going to talk a lot about them in his presentation next month. So, so important for those migrators. They're here early March through May. We need to have as much nectar plants. The migrators need them. And then that first generation needs them so we can give them a, a good send off uh, headed up north. So these are just a few, the Lantana, Coreopsis, Pink Invening, Primrose, Tropical Sage, Mexican Hat, Wine Cup, and many, many others. So, so important in our native milkweed too. And this is incredibly important in the fall. And they are on the way. I looked last night at Journey North. They are, there are roost of hundreds and hundreds uh, being noted in Ohio and Iowa and some other places. So they are on the way. They will be here before you know it. So it's great to have pollinator plants September through November, because I have seen them coming through here as late as Thanksgiving week here on the Gulf Coast. And this is not a monarch. This is a queen milkweed nectaring on one of our mist flowers. So mist flowers, sunflowers, frostweed, Turk's cap. We cannot have enough fall pollinator plants for these monarchs because they not only got to make it the rest of the way to Mexico, they've got to tank up and arrive with all those extra resources. A quick trip to Mexico. I went a couple of years ago with my friend that does monarch monitoring with me. This is El Rosero, the largest one that's open to the public. These are those OEML fir trees looking up at the trees. And these are actually clumps of monarchs, monarchs on the OEML trees, monarchs on the OEML trunks where you can't even see, see the trunk. There's so many. And as I said, every few days, they go get a drink of water. If it's sunny and warm, they take that opportunity to leave their roosts. Their metabolism raises enough from the warmth that they can go get a drink of water and they come right back and roost for another few days until the next day to go get a drink of water. If you note, there's a few pollinator plants here and there are not monarchs nectaring all over it. There is not enough here probably to do a thousandth of what monarchs are here all winter long. So they have to arrive with those resources. But it's a, if you ever get a chance to go, it's an incredible Beautiful, beautiful sight to see. Monarch Community Science Citizen Science Projects. I think I read 67, 60 something percent of every single monarch scientific study that comes out that's outside of the overwintering grounds because those are usually just open to for scientists to do research there uses citizen science data. It's that important. So Journey North is just one, and it's the easiest one. You can go there like I did last night and see the monarchs coming towards us in real time as people are making observations. You can make your own observations. In the spring, I think Candace and I planned on, and we have done it in the past, we have not done it in a couple of years, teach a monarch larval monitoring project class, how to get involved with these citizen science classes, Project Monarch Health, testing for OE, and this, of course, is uh, applying the... Uh, the numbers for Monarch Watch, the Monarch tags. And so there's my contact information. What is a time compensated sun compass? 
you know, that's what the scientists call it. So I think it is, it just uses, as they said, it uses information from, and I don't know because I'm not a scientist, how, how they, they process it, that in their little brains, but essentially <laughs> it is, it's a compass within their little brain that tells them what direction to go, but it uses the information from their antenna and their eyes. And, and that's all I can tell you about that. Fascinating. Do monarchs feed on any dog bane? They are closely related to milkweed. No. In fact, there's some dog banes. So I did some training with Monarch Joint Venture in, uh, in Minnesota, and they have a version of dog bane that is, I guess it's not from there, but they are finding it in Minnesota. And it is actually, monarchs think it may be milkweed because it is closely related and it is killing the caterpillars because it's so toxic. So no. Don't monarchs feed on milk vines and other milkweed vines, also like pearl milkweed? There's a couple of vines they cannot or do not use, but yes, there are a few vines that they do use, but they mostly use the Asclepius species. So native milkweed doesn't have any milk like latex when you cut the stem? Oh, yes, it does. All of it does except for tuberosa. Yes, only tuberosa does not have it. All the other ones do. And tropical does as well. But that's one way you can tell if something is labeled tuberosa and you're not sure that it is that you can tell it doesn't have that. But the little hairs are the best way. And that way you don't get milky latex on you in case it does. It's a relative easy way to test for OE at home. Pull out that bad milkweed. <laughs> You know, that's that's really the best thing. Yes, you can test the monarchs. You need a microscope and you need to you can do it on your own. But I always order the test kits from Project uh, Monarch Health because I like to look at it myself and then I send it off to them. But the thing is, when you send it to them, you may not hear back for weeks and weeks and weeks if that monarch is was infected. And I need to, I need to know real time. So I test myself and I send it off to them. I think this is the site in Mexico. Is that site protected globally? Yes. I see a good question in here. Can you please talk about the mark recapture tagging study if monarchs overwinter also migrate north again, where are they ultimately recaptured? Okay, so unfortunately, most of these, and you can go to Monarch Watch and, and kind of look at the tags that have been found. Most of these, and when I was there in Mexico, they found one or two. Most of these that they find are deceased monarchs. There are a lot of monarchs that make it to Mexico, but don't have those extra reserves. And so they, when they find them dead, they often will find, not often, they don't find a love, they will find a tag. They almost have rarely found a tag monarch that has made it back in the spring. So most of these tag monarchs that are they are noting are deceased in Mexico and they can tell from the tags where they were originally tagged. But unfortunately, that's all they know is that they made it as far as Mexico, not that they came back. There's not many tag that are found returning to the United States. I have native milkweed in my garden, but also tropical milkweed that I didn't plant. Yes. Do you recommend getting rid of the tropical? I know the answer to this question. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. Uh, there's just, there's, and there's even more studies. I only showed those two. There's just, uh, there's just an overwhelming accumulation of things that, that it really doesn't belong here. And it may be causing much more harm than good. And it really can't cause, cause any good because we have so many great made of milkweeds. So I know some people, it hurts to tear out that tropical, but as I said, purchase or, or grow a native milkweed and tear out one tropical. Do it one milkweed at a time so it's less painful. <laughs> yeah, I pulled mine out and they've come. I noticed I was out there today and I've got some coming back. Let me tell you, I have not had tropical milkweed since 2015 and I found one last year on my property and I have five acres. It did not come from, no neighbors grow any kind of milkweed. So I know it was in the soil bank. And that's a frightening thing that it's going to get outside and it already is getting outside of our gardens and be out in the wild where there's no one to cut it back. There's no one to monitor it and all that. So that is another danger with that, that I, you know, didn't even talk about. What do you think about giant milkweed? It's not even a milkweed, correct? That is correct. It's not a milkweed. It's from India. They have not done a lot of tests on that yet because tropical is such a huge problem in Florida and everything. Um, and monarchs will use it. I have had a giant milkweed. I Here's what I don't know. And what we don't know about uh, giant milkweed is we don't know about the new, because it's not a milkweed and it's not any milkweed. We don't know about that nutrition. If those monarchs, they may look like they're perfectly well, but they may not be able to migrate either. That last study that was done with 
with the uh, metabolism and everything. We just have no idea. So you cannot go wrong if you go with the milkweed that the monarch has been using for the last million years or so. And can you tell what variety of variegated milkweed is? Ah, uh, I don't know about any. I don't know any variegated milkweed. Chris, unbelievable. I know you went a thousand miles an hour to get all this information in. But I didn't I... want to skip. Oh, I took out probably 10 slides. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't want to go long, but. Thanks, Chris. Thank you so much. Thank Great you. presentation. See you Thank soon. You.